What's up guys? Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about acoustics and how you can apply the knowledge of acoustics and car audio to get the sound that you're looking for. The first thing we want to talk about is what you call phase cancellation. And I'm going to explain what phase cancellation and phase amplification is. First of all, you've already heard of a little thing called noise reduction. And that's where you talk into the microphone and you don't hear the background noise because there's something making that go away. Well, that noise cancellation and recording is done via a computer software. But what's interesting is whenever you're wearing the noise cancellation headphones and you're listening to your audible stuff on the headphones, but it blocks the noise. It makes the noise outside go away. Except you can still hear a voice when they come and talk to you. You just can't hear that ambient sound. What's happening is the uh, inside the headphones a little processor is listening to the outside noise and it's playing the reverse to that noise into your ear which cancels out those frequencies and it only works on something that's making a constant sound like an air conditioner running or an engine running or a fan blowing things like that that constant sound the computer goes hey that is you know, uh, 1227.3 hertz. So I'll play 1227.3 hertz in the opposite phase into their ear at the same amplitude and it will cancel that noise out. It works exactly the same way that whenever you have a subwoofer wired backwards in a box with two subs, they're both moving, but there's not much sound coming out. That's that phase cancellation happening. Well, here's where it applies to your car. In your car stereo. Of course, in a home stereo too, but this is a car audio channel. So we're talking about things with wheels, not things with recliners. Anyway, so you have the left channel and the right channel playing the same frequency. And that frequency is coming to your head if it gets to your head at the exact same time, it can cause a spike. So if the, the, amp, if the frequency is modulating in the same, uh, if the frequency is modulating in the exact reverse polarity, okay, so it's on the amplitude part of the modulation, and those two collide in one spot, both of them on the amplitude, on the hump, you'll end up amplifying that signal significantly. It'll be more than twice as loud. And if you're here in a car stereo and some frequencies you're just way out of whack, honky and, and kind of blaring a certain pitch of a certain singer's voice or a certain guitar sound, it's just way out of whack, that's what's causing that. Another thing that happens, and you don't notice this, when you're listening to music because it's not there. We're really good at noticing things that are that are there that shouldn't be there, but we're not good at noticing things that aren't there. And whenever you have that same hap thing happening and that frequency's coming and they both get to you on the downslope, they end up creating a much deeper downslope and they almost go completely away. And that is phase cancellation. Well, whenever you're tuning a car stereo, it's a lot more complicated than setting the EQ like you like it. That's the very, 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 very last thing that you can do. In most cases, you won't ever even do that. So what you're doing is you're picking out two drivers, a left and a right driver of the same group, right? So say, for instance, a left mid and a right mid, blah, blah, blah and you play a certain frequency and you're listening with your head pointed toward, toward the front trying to perceive where that sound is in the sound field and it should be if it's equal on both sides if you're playing a monotone and it's coming out of both both speakers exactly the same that sound should appear dead in front of you 
That's where your brain should put it at. So when you're tuning, if all of a sudden you ready, you got say you're doing 200 hertz, it's right there in front of you, and you go to one to 250, and all of a sudden it moves over here, over to the right. Now what's happening is at 250 hertz, that frequency is doing this in this space, and that amplitude pulls your ear that way. So what you have to do is decrease the uh you, you go to 250 hertz on the right channel and you decrease it by say uh 3 db and then you come to the left channel and you increase it by the same exact amount and that sound should move in front of you or move this direction you adjust that so that that sound moves until it's right in front of you again that is moving the point where those frequencies are peaking at. Now, if that peak is still really hot, so let's say you're sweeping from 100 to 200 hertz, and at 150 hertz it gets really loud. It's still right in front of you, but it gets much louder than 100 and 200, right? That's where you're having that, that, uh, that peak. So you want to go to both of those two and adjust them down, and then go do that sweep again and see if that sound at that pitch at 250 hertz or whatever it is, if it no longer sounds like it's louder, but it also sounds like it's standing in front of you. So when you're listening to the sound, uh, the sweep, 100 to 200 hertz, it should all, the 100, it should all be right in front of you and it should not be louder at any particular frequency during that sweep, okay? So, here's the thing about cars. And, uh, well, first of all, we have to talk a little bit about just room dynamics when it comes to sound reproduction and also recording, for that matter. Recording lays the problem down in the recording track. Okay, if you got a peaky room that peaks at 300 hertz, whenever you sweep past 300 hertz on a recording, it's going to put a hotter signal into the mic at 300 hertz. So studios tend to want to do the same thing for different reasons. When you're reproducing the track, playing it on the speakers, it's also going to peak at that same spot. Um, and, and so the same logic applies for both recording and listening when it comes to putting sound inside of a space to go into your ears. Square rooms with 90 degree walls, 90 degree ceilings and floors that are hard and flat and empty have an epic amount of problems. Echoes, all sorts of crazy uh, uh, tonal uh, disturbances and distortions. It's just a mess. Sometimes that mess on the creative end, on the recording end, that mess can actually sound pretty cool. And whenever you're creating a recording, you can add that color to the music, like adding distortion to a guitar, for example. It's part of the music that's being created. It's part of the art that's being created. But when you're recreating the music, you want to have as flat of a, of, of a system as possible. You don't want to add anything to that painting that wasn't already there. You want to keep it a nice, neutral space. And when you're in a square room with all flat, hard surfaces and all that, you're going to add tons of color to that music. And it's going it, to, in, in a lot of cases, it's going to just absolutely wreck it. The better room is a square room with lots of padding, window curtains, carpet on the floor, and some furniture in it. An even better room is a square room with all of that plus carpet on the ceiling, padding on all the walls, and, and lots of drapery hanging everywhere. An even better room is a room that's definitely not square that has all the same accoutrements to it. Okay, the more you can disturb the space and break away from uh, consistent mirror images of everything 
and the softer you can make those surfaces, the more cushiony and absorby and deflectory you can get them, the better. That's where car audio comes in. The cool thing about a car is it is full of reflective, bouncy, weird angles. Almost nothing in the car is 90 degrees with anything else. Even in a car with the windows are up, the windows are usually leaning in a little bit. All it takes is a little to throw everything off. The bad thing about a car is that it's half glass. Glass is hard, shiny, and solid, and extremely reflective. And the glass is all on the same plane. That's bad. Another bad thing about a car is it's a small space. That makes things more complicated. Another bad thing about a car is that you're not sitting in the middle of that room. You're sitting way over to the side, way up to the front. So now you have to train all of the uh, speakers to confuse your brain into thinking that you're sitting in an equal distance between those speakers. And that is where the DSP comes in. In order to do those tricks, to put yourself in the center of the music, to build the sound field equally out in front of you and put your brain in amazing mode, you have to be able to trick your brain into thinking that you're not where you are. Getting the DSP, learning to set it up right, is going to change everything. And the first time that you manage to get that tune somewhere in the neighborhood of 90% and you really get it to 90%, your mind will be completely blown and you will never build a car stereo again without a DSP in it. You get the frequencies figured out, get the image right here. Then uh, what also helps to center that image is time alignment. The funny thing about time alignment is people think of it as a tap, tap, tap thing. So, for example, uh, you know, okay, these two at the same time need to sound like they're hitting my ear at the same time. While that is correct, it's actually not correct. Um, what you're more time aligning is not the the snap on each side, it's the entire frequency of sound that's constantly moving. Okay, so you're not time aligning the pop, boom, boom voices, those synchronized things. You're time aligning a constant flood of variable information. And, and, and so where, where the one peak for one frequency and another frequency may meet here, you have to move them over, like I explained before. And then a, a bigger, lower frequency might meet here, you gotta move it over, like I explained before. And the time alignment is to try, because all those frequencies have different rates and different peaks and valleys. So if you look at what's coming at you, it isn't as simple as this. It's more like this. It's just, it's just chaos all over the place. And all of that information, you've got to try to get a bunch of it, the bulk of it, to hit your ears at the same part of its cycle. <clears throat> it is incredibly difficult uh, to do this. We can only get vaguely close. And whenever we get vaguely close, it sounds absolutely phenomenal. So you time align first, then you equalize. But I will say this, whenever you get a tune that sounds pretty dang good, save that tune. Save, save, save. Um, another thing you can do is write down the tune. Get a piece of paper and pencil out. Write down your time alignment numbers. Write down all that stuff. Uh, if you don't want to write it down, if you're doing it on a computer, you can screenshot it. And you can go back and reference it later like that. On your phone, you can screenshot that. You can get a car stereo to sound as good as a pair of really nice headphones. 
but it's not going to have a lot of that bouncing. It's going to be more just direct sound, sound absorption, proper time alignment, proper EQing, all those things will make it sound amazing. So, guys, if you enjoyed this little lesson in acoustics tonight, and if you want me to go down this hole a little further at some point in time, be sure to hit me up in the comments. Got questions you want to ask? You got something you want to correct me on? Let me know. But above all else, I love you guys and thank you for being my subscribers. We should hit a thousand subscribers tonight and it's all because of you guys. Thank you very much. Peace.